Welcome to Death and Aliens, an in-depth look at horror and sci-fi TV from two friends who vaguely know what they're doing. I'm MK. And I'm Courtney. And um, Courtney, how are you this week? Well, I am in my cozy flannel. Very nice. It's finally fall. It's nice and rainy out. Um, I'm finally making money again at the bar. Nice. And last but certainly not least... I have re-signed up for the season pass at Alamo Draft House, and you can find me at the movies now every day. Not every day, I work a lot, but, but I'm not working so far. So I, I signed back up Thursday. Good <laughs> Friday, I went and saw "Don't Worry, Darling," which was lovely. I mm. was pretty sure that's the new the new Harry Styles one, right? Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, did you ever watch Midsummer? No. Okay. So they're very different. They're entirely different movies, except that Florence Pugh is in both of them. But I had the same feeling leaving both that like okay. I was in a fever dream. Okay. And it great. didn't help that like when I got upstairs, so I, so I went to Alamo Draft House in Lower Manhattan because it's close to the one in Brooklyn. And so when I got downstairs, um, I came back up and it had changed from daytime to the bar being open at nighttime and they had closed the door that I came into oh. and I didn't know how to get out. <laughs> and oh, yeah, that would be concerning. Yeah. I, and I was in this fever dream and I'd had two drinks, which I had like, I had like a Jameson cold brew whiskey, not whiskey, no whiskey. They were out of that one. Jameson cold brew milkshake thing. And then like half a beer. So when like, I was like, lit or anything but i guess that with the movie with the scenery change three off a lot very thrown off um but nonetheless i went back the next morning because they did a francis coppola double feature oh and i saw dementia 13 and betwixt for the first time and i now feel like aside from like the godfather you know like the film he's known for yeah. His horror is like kind of a knockoff Hitchcock. I believe it. Yeah. Um, but I really liked Dementia 13 and didn't okay. catch the Twixt. It was fine, but like, meh. Okay. You have to watch it. But everyone should watch Dementia 13. It was pretty good. It was black and white. It was all. Mm. How are you? <laughs> well, this week I had my first um, show at Shays for our. Broadway series for the season Um, and for the first time like ever I did not work a single shift of the show I only saw it as an audience member nice what show was it again have we already talked about this we did not talk about it um it was the I mean thing I think I mentioned what it was but we didn't talk about it because I saw it on Wednesday so um it was the prom I have not seen The Prom yet, okay. even though I know they made a movie about it, too, and I also haven't seen They movie. did make a movie about it. I haven't watched the movie yet because I knew it was coming this season to Shays, so I didn't want to watch it until I yeah, s- yeah. experienced it. Um, and so do you know what it's about? Absolutely not. Okay. Not even so a little it, bit. It is a story of this um, high school girl who is a, a senior in high school, and she is a lesbian. And the PTA responds to her wanting to go to prom with another girl by just, like, shutting the entire prom down and canceling it. Oh, I think I did know that. And so then a bunch of, like, washed-up narcissistic Broadway stars decide that they're going to get themselves some good PR by going to Indiana and saving this girl in her prom and then learning lessons about being human along the way. Um, and I was like, I'm not going to care. Like I'm going to see it and it's going to be fine, but I'm not going to care. And then about halfway through the first act, I remember that when I was a senior in high school, I didn't get to go to prom with the person I was dating because we went to an all girls Catholic school and we were both girls. (laughs) So we both went to prom but not together and like just had to pretend that we weren't together so then I was like oh oh I'm having feelings that I forgot yeah. existed that's it happening home a bit. it did but then the worst part was that actually the story that hit home more for me was the story of um 
the principal and one of the Broadway stars end up together. But like, she is obnoxious and full of herself. And the principal is just like the most calm down to earth, like ridiculously like good natured human being who like just knows that she could be a good person. And like some of their conversations, I literally just looked at Dan and I go, why is, why is that us? Why, how, how is this? I, what? So I felt so many things. (laughs) Well, um, I did hear the movie sucked, so maybe don't watch it. I, yeah, I think about the show and you love it. I've heard the movie sucked um, a lot and that, um, unfortunately, so here's the thing. Um, people in the Broadway fan outside of New York community <laughs> yes. um, have a very, very strong opinion of James Corden. I yes, I've noticed that. And it is not a positive one. No, not at all. But here's the thing. I'm obsessed with James Corden. And I have been since well before he did anything in America. Like back when he was still doing like small TV in England. I've always been a ridiculously large fan of his. I paid for CBS All Access just because I didn't want to have to record the late, late show every night. And I would just watch it when I woke up in the morning. Like that's how much of a James Corden fan I am. So most people who said the movie was terrible, their opinion was based entirely on James Corden. That's true. That's true. So I don't know if the movie's actually going to be bad. See, I don't think I've seen him in a musical, but I, I mean, I love him. He was in i I've seen him. Was he did like an episode or two of Dr. Who, right? He was in the, yeah. The baby, the river. Yes, Stormageddon, Stormageddon did the Dark Lord of All as his child. Absolutely. Correct. Yes. Correct. And uh, so I saw those, and I think he was the friend in um, that movie with Adam Levine and Mark Ruffalo. Mm, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't remember. really um, got into for a very long time. I think he was the friend in um, it. So he was in um, Cinderella. Um, the one with Billy Porter is the fairy godmother, um, which to be fair, was just a terrible movie, like point blank period. Yeah, yeah. It was not good. Um, but Camilla Cabello was Cinderella, mm-hmm. which What's was like, a, yeah, it was yeah. The, the whole movie was a stretch. Um, <laughs> he was in Cats. Yes. Which was, uh, I knew about without a doubt, the worst movie ever created. And it, sh- it is cursed. Like, That's what I've heard. I haven't seen it either. Um, I watched it on the plane on the way home from Thailand, but I didn't watch it. I put it on and then put my um, (laughs) eye covers on and just listened to the soundtrack to fall asleep because everyone in it could sing. And Cats is really not a good story anyway. It's just good music. But what I saw, I wish I could unsee. I think Cats was like the first show I saw I saw like in the park when I was little Mm. and I've seen it like a couple times since and I couldn't tell you what it's about I don't remember it's not good um but he was the baker in the into the woods movie oh that was probably fine then I don't remember having no it was I genuinely adored him as the baker I thought he was phenomenal um I saw that in theaters like three times I've only seen it once or twice, maybe, but I remember really liking it and not having yeah. any um, strong feelings against anyone. Oh, I have strong feelings against Johnny Depp as the wolf, but I think it was more the direction that they put him in, mm. not him. It was weird. Yeah. Um, but so, again, is he bad in those movies or are those movies just bad? Like, you know what I mean? Right. Right. So that is, I don't know. I don't know. Um. Well, I'll probably never watch the movie. I will probably watch it on stage if I ever get a chance. Um, so well, I don't time. know that you will get a chance because it definitely is closed on Broadway and they the national tour um, Buffalo was their last stop. So they're also closed like on the national this tour. year. But like in the future, if there's, if there's I mean, ever like if there's like ever like another national tour or something. They could do like well, off Broadway. They could do another national tour. There's all, yeah, so many that's things. Fair. That's fair. Pinky Boots is back. High schools will do it. <laughs> Exactly. I'll find it somewhere. <laughs> um, um, yeah, so that was my big exciting thing of the week um, was the prom. 
and I wore like a pretty fancy dress and we went to get really sh- shitty cheap tacos before as if like it was a real prom. It was fantastic. I love it. You were very cute. I liked your pictures. Thanks. Um, you know what I like? Spiritual awakenings. Do you have any spiritual awakenings you'd like to tell us about? No, I just would like um, advice oh, from you. okay. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i uh can have that for you in a hot second are you sure you don't have any spiritual awakenings honestly no i gosh i wish i did like i wish that this had been a really like awakened week but it yeah. really wasn't Um, mostly I just worked a lot and was tired a lot and, um, also like felt like absolute garbage for like three days and just like did nothing but like lay on the couch and whine and make Dan make dinner for me because I was awful. That sounds like a lovely, uh, um, like literally I was like, I'm gonna lay in bed with a heating pad while you make uh unicorn shaped mac and cheese sounds like a deal i think that is the best way to do it (laughs) i think so too it was it was great okay are you ready (laughs) your affirmation now that it i'm ready to be affirmed great um at this oh no that's not the right one can't afford to let people's preference make me think less of myself I'm gold. I'm gold. But some people prefer silver, and that's okay. It's beautiful. Isn't it, though? I love that. The panic affirmation actually turned out to be beautiful. So. All right. I love it. Um, yeah, so. Yeah. Sometimes you're gold, but people want silver. And as someone who has a very strong um, metal preference, um, I get that because I hate gold. But then also, I've been wearing nothing but gold jewelry for the last two months. Mm -hmm. Not not really sure how that happened. Um, No one else, I'm not really sure how it happened. (laughs) (laughs) This episode of Stargate SG1. This one felt a little more like it was on par than... I'm very confused, to be honest. Did you watch the same episode? No. Yeah, yes. Okay. Because I'm confused because I didn't have a problem with the episode. Okay. But it's the lowest rated episode of the season. <gasps> this is the lowest rated? This is the lowest rated episode of the season. I would like to speak to every person that has critiqued the show. Yeah. Which is- well, because remember, I told you, I told you last week that we were in for something rough because the, it was only rated six point seven stars. Right. I forgot, but then it wasn't, and I mean, it like made sense for what we've seen before. Like, I mean, I would definitely wouldn't put it like above eight point five, but like, no, uh, and I probably wouldn't put it there in the season. But at least this episode fits into the show. Correct. Um, mm. Yeah. So. Have some um, words. We watched Stargate SG-1 Season 2, Episode 8, entitled Family, which, as we have discussed, was rated a 6.7 stars. Wild. Wild. Um, <laughs> I'm dying. I know. I know. It's, it's, you can't help it. The spirit <laughs> has overcome you. Mm. Against all of Ooh. these Stargate haters. Ooh, um... It was released on August 14th in 1998. Number one song, still, Brandy and Monica, Boy Is Mine. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I watched that video if you haven't yet. Uh, I haven't, but at this point, I think that that might be the only song I ever talk about for the rest of my life. It might be, and you should definitely watch the music video so you can mm-hmm. add that to your discussion. It's very dramatic, and I love it. Okay. Um, the number one movie is Still Saving Private Ryan. Shocked. The number one book is called I Know This Much Is True by Wally Lamb. Mm -hmm. Um, 
I don't know anything about the book really, um, but it is a story about identical twins and one of them has schizophrenia and it's mm-hmm. very dramatic. It was made into an HBO miniseries in mm-hmm. 2020 that starred Mark Ruffalo as both twins. I haven't watched it, but I have heard of it. Okay. I think that was uh, one of Wally Lamb's like first big books. And it was his second novel but it might have been his first big one but i know it was his yeah. second novel because i just added his he just had another one come out recently that i've just oh. added to my my list okay. i've heard of him and like when i saw that it had was made into a mini series i vaguely remembered the mini series being like released and like mark ruffalo because it was released in 2020 which not a lot of things were right and um and Mark Ruffalo got some pretty decent acclaim for it. So, like, I knew it existed. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then when I was looking it up, I was like, this actually seems really interesting. Yeah, his new one is called... Nope, that's not it. That says 1998 on it. I don't know. There's one I've, I've literally just added to my list, and I can't find it now. But it came out recently. Um, okay. I'm sorry. It's okay. Oh, you don't know me. He wrote, "You don't know me." The incarcerated women of York Prison voice their truths. Okay. It came out in twenty nineteen, so it's not like yesterday it came out. But right, that's the one that I've like heard really good things about. Yeah. Was- okay. All right. Let me see, Wally Lamb. Mm-hmm. Um, this episode was directed by William Garrity and written by Catherine Powers, so nothing new there. Now the guest star. I wrote so much. So much. Because the guest the guest star um, is Brooke Susan Parker, who plays Dreyok. Now, trivia for this episode, that is not the actress who played Dreyok the first time. I put that in my notes. Uh, uh, I know um, it. Yes, it was, it was fairly noticeable. She didn't look anything like the original one. Not at all. But Brooke Susan Parker is best known for the 1995 movie Strange Days, which I have absolutely never heard of, mm-hmm. and this role in Stargate. So not, okay. so not a huge um, acting resume to speak of. But, and this is a big but, <clears throat> she's the founder of More to Life, Inc., which is an open doors outreach network. She writes books and educational curriculum on sexual exploitation, trafficking, and gender-based violence as an advocate and survivor. She has met with and spoken with multiple presidents and prime ministers of multiple countries. She has a PhD in pastoral clinic counseling and has a patent for a software that runs case management. She's a fucking software is? Um, no, I don't know what the software, but case management for like mental health and like clinicking stuff. Oh, I, okay. I, yeah. Um, I don't have never heard of her, but she's a fucking badass. She's got a lot happening. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, also, this movie she was in has Angela Bassett and Juliette Lewis. So, like, sci fi thriller. No. So, you know, um, not, not mad about it. I literally was like, this woman is cooler than I will ever be. What is her name? Brooke what? Brooke Susan Parker. I love her. She has like an she like has like a medal of honor from Obama and like has like spoken at like a bunch of different shit. She has a PhD. She like has a patent. Like she's just and, and like and, and, and she And she's a survivor of sex trafficking. And then did all of that shit. She has lived a whole life multiple times. And then was like, fuck it, I'm also going to be an actress. Because why not? Why not? Do that too. Um, Yeah, so she is amazing. So Mm, I love her. For her. Yeah. But yeah. uh, We start the episode. With the gate being activated, but no one is scheduled to return that day, so everyone is a little bit panicked. Um, the gate was dialed in with an SG1 access code, despite the fact that SG1 is there on base. Great. So that's a little confusing. A little concerning. 
Um, the only person who has that access code that is not already in the room with them is Braytalk. And he wasn't supposed to use it unless there was an emergency. Right, right. So we know there is an emergency. There is an emergency. Yes, <laughs> yes correct. Um, we also get confirmation about something that you and I had previously discussed being unaware of, and that is confirmation that SG-1 does in fact believe that Apophis and Chloral are dead, despite yeah. the fact that we know that they are not. Exactly. Um, so they open the gate, or the iris, and Braytok comes in and greets them and is like, Hammond of Texas, I request to enter your facility. And then he, like, greets them all and is being very formal. And then he's like, Tilk, my old friend, got some real bad news. Yeah. As bad news is that Ryak has been taken by... Apophis. Yeah. We learn real fast why it's called the family. Um, and uh, then we have the credits. Mm-hmm. Um, it was a, this was a very dramatic opening before yes. the credits. I loved it. <laughs> oh, yeah. It also wasn't unnecessarily long. No. It was, like, it was like big, big news scene, drama, cliffhanger. Like, boom. I thought it was one of my favorite openings, I think, so far to start yeah. with. Lowest rated. But you know, right? I was just about to say, what? These people don't know um, anything about anything. So then we get there into the little room where they're having their meeting, and Hammond is a little pissed off because he's like, You guys told me that Apophis was dead. And right. Jack's like, And Jack's like, We blew the ship to quite literal smithereens. There's no way he wasn't dead. <laughs> and Braytok's like, yeah, no, but they escaped through the gate that was on the ship. And Daniel's like, oh, yeah, I did that, too. They must have also been able to do that. That makes sense. And I'm just like, Daniel Jackson, you were the stupidest smart person I've ever seen. Right. The, the number of times that Daniel says things that he, it's like, how many doctorate degrees do you have and you couldn't figure that fucking out? Plus his heart. I mean, to, to be fair, I have a doctorate degree and I can't say the word friend today. So I, I don't know how much I can judge Daniel Jackson today. But we love him. Um, I am still going to get a doctorate degree. That was a conversation I had last week where I was told in no uncertain terms that I am not allowed to give that up. Good, good. I yeah. that. <clears throat> stupid, stupid, healthy relationships where men try to tell you to do things for yourself. The worst. Whatever. The worst. Anyway, um, <laughs> um, and then they also discuss that um, Apophis definitely took. Ryak specifically to get to Teal'c. Right. Um, so we also learned that most of Apophis's servants were destroyed when the ship exploded and he has a very weakened power and not many people left loyal to him. Uh, and Chulak is in chaos. So the team has an opportunity to strike now while the iron's hot before the Gawold send in a new system lord to take over where Apophis has failed. Right. <laughs> Um, so Hammond is like I'm not going to send you guys in literally the reason you kept your family a secret was so that you wouldn't become vulnerable and now you are in fact vulnerable no, so right. like let's not <clears throat> and Jack and Braytuck argue that this is the best time to try and get Apophis like while they're still able to save Ryak they're like this is the only time we're ever going to be able to t- kill two birds with one stone like you have to let us try um <clears throat> So Hammond agrees, but says that the mission directive is only to return Ryak and Dreyok to Earth. That sounds like it'll go well. Well, of course. What would you expect? No notes. No, no. Mm. So they go back to Chulak in disguise. And they... 
those are not great disguises. <laughs> like, they just put a cloth over them, it seemed. And I was like, <sighs> maybe, like, from the back you can't tell it's them. But, like, I mean, to be fair, in Aladdin and the King of Thieves, that's all that his dad had on, and then you didn't know he was his dad, just that he was the King of Thieves. And I, I don't, don't know. know why that's the only reference point I have. <laughs> well, I do not remember King of Thieves, so I cannot be with you on that one. I've watched it, but it was like 25 years ago, probably 20 years ago. And, um, but like, they don't look like everyone else there anyway. So, like, they already stand out even in their quote unquote disguises. They had most of their faces covered. Yeah, but, like, everyone else is wearing different clothing. Well, we don't, we don't see most of the people, yes, to, be fair. Like people. <laughs> to be fair. We really only see, like, three people, and they're all yes. rich. Yeah. Fair. So. Um, they go to Dreyok's home, and they meet Frotok. And Frotok is apparently an old confidant of Teal'c, and immediately I go, oh, this is bad. Yep. <laughs> um, and it is because it turns out that while Teal has been gone, uh, Dreyak has annulled her marriage and now married Frotok. Correct. I was like, um, this Brotok fella just, is his name Brotok or Frotok? Frotok. Frotok took over Teal's life. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think of why that plot seemed ridiculously cliche to me and what movie I was thinking of. Because every royal family, when someone died, the brother married the wife? Yeah, no, no, no. But there was like a movie, specifically a scene in a movie that I was thinking about where somebody disappeared for a really long time and then they came back and their spouse had moved on and married someone else because they thought that they were dead. This just feels like a trope. To me. I don't know. Oh, Forrest Gump. Not Forrest Gump. Not Forrest Gump. Castaway. When he gets back from the ocean and Castaway yes. and he yes. meets the new husband. Correct. That's the scene I was thinking of. I was like, I don't know why I'm thinking of this scene in particular or why I'm thinking of Tom Hanks. And then I was like, that's, that would be it. That's it. <clears throat> but yeah but literally as he starts walking down the stairs i immediately got the same vibe as i got in the scene in from castaway and i go oh fuck they're married <laughs> i knew I, <laughs> I knew it exactly what i saw it too i was like oh no yeah but like he hasn't been gone that long right like you're supposed to be gone seven years to be considered dead in the u.s and he hasn't maybe apparently on chula it? apparently on chula it's more like a year and a half or like five days or something i don't know like we're midway through season two and we know that at least a year happened in season one probably more because they talk about large like, chunks of time how do we know like they didn't just get married today probably no so they could have been married from like the last time he left like the the day and he's seen her so he hasn't even been gone a year and a half he's been gone what like maybe six months Something. I, don't, I don't know. I mean, to be fair, when she goes on to describe her reasons, I'm not mad about it. No, they I'm absolutely make sense. I'm a little bit mad about it. I think she absolutely did the right thing. And like, who better to move on with than like your best friend? At least you know she's being taken care of by someone who's a good person. Oh, right. And someone who believes in the same things that Teal believes in. Like, right. it's not somebody who's going to like go and sell them out to a office. So, right. um, but Teal justifiably reacts by immediately trying to kill Frotok. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, totally understand. And he's angry that Braytok let this happen and he starts like getting mad at Braytok too. Yeah. And then this is where things get confusing because Braytok swears he didn't know. And I don't think he's yeah. lying. But also, like, he knew that Dreyak was and Ryak were living in Frotok's house and that he had set up, like, a resistance camp via Frotok's right. house. So how did he not know they were married? Right. 
someone's lying there is bad writing definitely a piece missing in this puzzle that i'm not 100 um, sure i also want to make note that, um, while this guy is meant to be from chulak um when he says sorry you can definitely tell he's canadian because <laughs> oh, <shit. laughs> i like he was pretty much in character the whole time that he said sorry and i was like i just bust out laughing i was like okay well <laughs> it's fine we're still in canada yeah um the worst part is I didn't notice that because I too say sorry. Right. Um, <laughs> I notice every time. Don't worry. Right. Um, um, but he, so Bray talks like, I didn't know that this is where things were going. I promise. But like, also I, I genuinely think that we can trust Frotak with the mission. At least I don't, I don't know about the personal life stuff, but like with what we believe in, he is on our side. Mm-hmm. Fine. Um, Daniel, is like, here, let me offer you my perspective. And I really, really, truly thought Daniel was going to give some like impassioned speech about hoping the best for Share wherever mm-hmm. she is and how long that they've been apart. But then- You don't care about Share anymore. She's over. Right. She's, she's, gone. she's gone. Because then he starts talking about that, how it's not fair to Teal, but at least by marrying Protoc, Drac was able to save Ryak and herself from the, their outcast state and like have a better life and like gives all the completely logical and justifiable reasons why this happened. But the fact that like he didn't give his perspective from the point of view <laughs> of someone whose spouse has literally been taken from them for years pissed me <laughs> all the way off. Because we just pretend like she's not real. I don't know what to tell you. We don't have Sharae anymore. She's gone. We've lost her to Apophis. And we'll never see her again. Never. That's what I'm telling myself to push through. Because if not, I'd just yell at every episode. Like I did the first season. Fucking obnoxious. Yeah. Um, And Bray talks like, hey, like, I agree with Danielle. And I need you to promise me not to hurt Frotok before we continue this mission so you can focus on your son. And he says some Chulak word and then we have a moment of Daniel (laughs) Daniel translating it. But basically he's just like, please don't fucking kill him. Like I I can't handle that on top of the other shit we're doing right now. Can we take care of everything else first and and address this situation? Right. And Teal's like, fine, I promise. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um... Tilk uh, tells Dreyak that he will rescue Ryak, and once his son is safe, he will leave and never lay eyes on her again. Which was a little dramatic. It was a, it was a little dramatic. I was like, how, how dare you? Like, but like, I understand to you're upset. Be fair. I was like, whoa, dramatic. But then I thought about it, and I was like, even if he genuinely thought I was dead, if Dan married someone else I would quite literally kill her in her sleep in the slowest most painful way possible so like I don't even know why I'm judging Teal'c so I'm glad you gave your opinion because I was gonna ask your opinion (laughs) because I was gonna say as someone who does not have a partner I would think that like but I also like I don't know I don't attach as much I guess And so I think if I were to die or be lost to existence or something for ages, seven years minimum, that's how long it takes to be considered dead when you're lost. But seven years, I would want them to move on and maybe with somebody that I knew because I knew they'd be with someone good. Like, I think I'd be okay with it. Interestingly enough, Dan and I actually just talked about this last week. (laughs) Because I keep telling him that if anything ever happens to him, I'm going full Victorian mourning, like black veil fancy dress like full victorian widow mourning period which in proper victorian etiquette a widow has to wear black and have her face covered and veiled and not work and not do anything but mourn for two years minimum i would also like to go into victoria mourning yeah um i was like so that's where i will be hopefully we die you die rich enough that i can afford to not do anything for two years but like so then i was explaining this and everything and he was like well like why couldn't i do the same thing and i go oh you want to know why so i pulled up some victorian etiquette stuff to show him 
<clears throat> Victoria, women, when their husbands died, were required to mourn for a full two years. Mm-hmm. Men, when their wives died, were required to wear mourning clothes, which were not anything other than their regular suit and coat, but they got to, <laughs> they had to wear black gloves instead of white for three weeks. Who's wearing white gloves to it? These men in their white gloves, you know they're not clean. They're like, I would wear black gloves. I would literally, I would just be a morning. But I go, I go, I died. I go two years, two years, three weeks. That's, that's why it doesn't matter if you become a Victorian widower or not, because you only have three weeks required. And he goes, so you can become a women's Victorian. You can get the black dress and veil. (laughs) And be in mourning for two years. Um, and um, yes. I will come to beside you and also yeah. do the same. But Correct. I will need you to pay for my life, too. So I hope you have enough for both of us. Because I would also like to just be in mourning MR Black for two years and not work. Um, yeah. So we actually literally talked about that last week. Um, mm-hmm. I fully was like, no. like He was like, but I would like want you to be happy again. And I was like, <laughs> and I, no. And he was like, and I was like, I'm not even going to sit here and tell you that I would want you to be happy again. When I die, you were never allowed to love someone else. Like, that's not, that, no, that's not how that works. Marry you because I feel like me and Dan are on the same page. So I'm going to find someone that's just like you and it's going to be chaos in my life. Doug, Doug and I are the same person. Oh God. Chaos. Chaos, I tell you. He's a little less intense than I am. I'm not sure anyone's as intense as you are. Let's start there. Fair. But yeah, so um, I too would vow to never lay eyes on him again if he ever moved on from me. So I was fully with Teal despite the drama. Okay, well, I'll say uh, I'll say you away from him so he can be happy if you die first. <laughs> I want Dan to be happy. I mean, like, I, I do. I also want him to be happy. But only with you. Sorry, I'm selfish. I don't know what you want from me. So I will protect him and make sure he's able to be happy afterwards. And this is why he's not allowed to listen to this podcast. (laughs) I'll tell him to. I'll put it on Instagram. (laughs) Um, So then uh, Tilk goes to sit outside in his anger and Dreyok follows him to talk to him alone and then she gets like nasty to him about the way he spoke to her and Freyog which are for fair. her talk which fair but she's like how dare you come into my house and speak to me and my husband that way and I was like ma'am you were speaking to your husband that way well she didn't say she couldn't speak to her husband that way she said he couldn't speak to her husband that way she, but he is her husband and she can speak to him that way if she wants you don't get to have two husbands ma'am <laughs> You don't know anything about Chulak? Maybe they can have two husbands. I don't know their legal system. I'm not a Chulak lawyer. Now I'd like to be, but I'm not currently. Um, so basically, Tilk is like, are you in love with him? And she takes a minute. And then she decides to be honest. And she's like, no, I don't love him. I just couldn't continue to watch my son live in those camps and be an outcast. And I I needed a better life. And he's the only one who asked. That's so sad. It was so sad. But also, like, good on her for being so, like, honest. And good on her for being able to separate what was best for her son versus what was best for her. Because, like, in in, in her heart, she did not want to leave Teal'c. She didn't want to abandon him, but she also knew that, like, that wasn't going to help. So, like, to be fair, caveat, if I die and our children are still young enough that they need a mother and Dan finds someone who is able to care for them and provide for them in the ways that I would have been able to, I will accept it. I will, I will make sure that it rains on their wedding day. 
That's good luck. Yeah, but it's a pain in the fucking ass. You end up with candy sprinkles everywhere. That's what happened on Caitlin's wedding day, remember? Oh, yeah. (laughs) That did happen. Good times. Good times. Um, So then we go inside and we are looking at how to solve a problem like Maria. And um, Throw Talk has made a map of the palace where Ryak's being held. And the team starts making plans to get in there at night and try to take Ryak out. Everything seems like it's moving way too fast for how many minutes are left in this episode. (laughs) Yes. Correct. So they go to the palace. They ambush the guards. They break into the palace. They get to the room where Ryak is. They let him out and then he screams and lets them know that the guard know that Teal'c is there and calls him a traitor. Hashtag devastation. I know. I was like, does he not know who Teal'c is? We saw him already and he knew yeah. that Teal'c was like this. He was totes fine with him. Yeah. Um, so then Teal'c is obviously visibly shaken at the idea that his son thinks he's a traitor. And it turns out... Yeah, turns out that Ryak has been brainwashed by Apophis. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, so they go home and Tilk is telling Dreyak what has happened in the palace and how awful everything is. And then Apophis appears to address the people of Chulak with the weird Wizard of Odd's globe. My fave. Um, we talked about how obsessed with it we were the last time it was in there, but then this time, as I was watching it and it was like just sitting in the house, I literally was like, Oh, the Wicked Witch of the West with the Flying Monkeys. That's quite literally what this is. Yeah. Got yeah. it. Cool. Correct. Um, yeah. So um, then Apophis brings Ryak there to address the people as well and makes him say that Teal'c is evil. And Apophis offers a reward for Teal'c and the SG team and claims that they have Dreyak as a prisoner. And then Ryak says something about his mother until just goes, oh, that was secret code. He's fine. Yeah. It's like, okay. He's like, yeah, um, that was definitely a secret code because he said that she was from this place and that's not true. And Jack is um, rightfully incredibly skeptical. Right? Um, and Braytock and Jack are like, Teal'c, my dude, this seems like a trap. It's a little bit too good to believe. And Teal'c's like, absolutely not. Hidden message. Done. He's fighting the brainwashing. He is strong. We got this. Um, Teal'c is obviously blinded by love for his family because that is the dumbest conclusion he has come to absolutely. ever on the show. Extremely quick <laughs> logic. Yeah. That was, even I was like, no. It made me think of that film based off of a true story about, it's like, I think it's called The Imposter, where it's like, this kid goes missing for like seven years, and then he comes back, and he's like, in France, and it's like, I'm your kid, and it's like, the wrong eye color, but they're so blinded that he said he went through all these trials, and they just believed it was him for like, ages. You know, I don't, I don't remember the movie but i definitely remember the news story when that happened mm-hmm. wild that's exactly what i thought of during this scene i was like, I was like right if we hadn't already seen ryak like in the show i would have been mm-hmm. like that's not even your kid dude yeah i did question <laughs> whether or not it was the real ryak or not yeah um, so then the Jaffa arrived to ha- the house to search, like, Frotak's house, and he accuses them of, like, wasting time, and he actually, like, is like, they stole my wife, and they've kidnapped her. Why would they be hiding in my house? What kind of person do you think I am? Like, I'm gonna go to Apophis about you, and the serpent guard is like, bitch, Apophis sent us. Shut the fuck up. But his, uh, his stalling and fighting with the guards gives Dreyak enough time to hide everyone in a weird secret panel on the wall, and so Teal um, decides that this is enough for him to know he can trust for a talk. Mm-hmm. For about again, again, um, Teal is jumping to all of the conclusions. Like 
he's basically playing Frogger over the truth to just get to conclusions. I don't know what he's doing. Um, so then Teal and Dreyok are worrying about Ryak and they're staying up all night because they can't sleep because they just are having feelings and their feelings of pain over the loss of their son um, bring them together again and they start kissing and Frotox sees them naturally and his, and his immediate reaction like immediate reaction is not to fight Teal to talk to his wife to like take a minute to reflect on the fact that she only married him because she thought he was dead. It's to go to Apophis and betray Teal. Right. Me- like, literally like that second. He was like, got it. Cool. You want to steal my wife? Fuck you. Yeah. He was like, and that it- guard I just told 30 seconds to go to leave. Now I'm going to tell him to come back. Like, and like to be fair, I might have done the same thing. I mean, I would have been really pissed, but I probably would not have. I would have been very sulky, and I would have made a big dramatic scene, but I probably would not have put anyone's life at danger. If an ex of Dan's showed up and tried to take him from me, I would, I wouldn't care even a little bit if she was a good person. Immediate betrayal. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, no, it's immediate portrayal, but like that feels like a big punishment to send them to Apophis when he knows that like his immediate thing he's going to do is kill him and maybe his son. A kid, yeah, that would. Yeah, uh, you uh, yeah you're right. Him. You're right. You're right. The kid, the kid doesn't deserve it. Um, luckily, uh, Jack sees what Frotak is doing and follows him. Yeah, I was like, I was like, okay, good timing, Jack. Just come around right. the corner like a creeper, but good, um, good for you. Yeah, so he, well, because they showed him laying in bed watching Frotak watch mm-hmm. them, and so um, I was like, good for Jack. So Jack follows him to the, to Apophis's palace and, like, stuns him with his at gun, and it's like, listen, like, you don't have to do this. We need to have a conversation. Like, there has to be a better way. And um, Protoc's like, huh, nope, psych. So uh, Jack does the logical thing and just disintegrates the fuck out of him. Yep. yep. Um, the guards seal the palace and trap Jack inside, which seems like it's going to be a bigger problem. And it was not. And then it, the immediate next scene is a snake guard, a serpent guard, appearing at Frotak's home mm-hmm. and busting its way in the house. And Braytok and Dreyok are like, excuse me. And uh, Jack pops the helmet off and is like, man, no wonder these guys are cranky. It's fucking hot in here. Yeah. I was like, all right, so- that was a very quick save. Yeah, so that problem was solved immediately, which, again, I think one of the reasons why this episode is probably rated a little lower than it deserves is because every time a problem appears, the save, way too quick. Okay, but that's not, like, super new to this show. No, it's not, but, like, it's <laughs> extreme. Like, the number of the number of things that could have been, like, episode-long mm-hmm. troubles that are, like, Introduced, saved. Introduced, saved. Introduced, saved. Mm -hmm. Through the whole episode. Poorly written, for sure. Yeah. Um, Not in overall Stargate terms. Not a bad episode, because it actually, like, I don't know, has something to do with the plot that we think that we're watching. Um, (laughs) In terms of, like, well-crafted episodes, it's weak. Yeah. Um, So, they go to the Grove. Oh, and obviously he tells them that Frotak tried to betray them and he killed them. Oops. Right. Yeah. Um, they go to the they go to the grove to meet Ryak and they kill a bunch of serpent serpent guards and uh, save Ryak and he's so excited to see his father. And um Jack is like <sighs> doesn't doesn't seem no, something's off. This is wrong. This is super wrong. And Teal's like, I trust my son. I know my son. Yeah. 
This is where I thought that he was not the real Ryak because, like, I, I agree with Jack. Everything's too easy. Everything's too easy. So then Jack just, like, really can't shake the feeling that something is wrong, but he doesn't know what other choice they have. So he's like, okay, like, let's get him back to Earth. Because in Jack's mind, they get him back to Earth. Dr. Frazier examines him. We figure out it's not Ryak. Like, there's got to be more to this. Um, so they clear the singular guards, two, only two, that are blocking the Stargate, which, again. Also a sign that this is not as. Right. Um, they dial home. They take Jayok through the gate. They're about to take Ryak through the gate. They're going to take Braytok, but he's like, no, I'm, I'm going to stay on Chulak. Which kind of Braytok's MO, so fine. Right. And then I realized that there was still another 10 minutes of this episode, and I was like, <laughs> what the fuck? I was like, that seems like the end of an episode. Just, oh, just kidding. Just we're kidding. Not we're, not even, we're not even close. So we go back to Earth, to base. Dr. Frazier agrees that physically Ryak doesn't seem to be a threat of any kind. Nothing is wrong with him. He doesn't have anything in his system, blah, blah, blah. Um, and Jack's like, okay, fine, but we're going to keep a guard on him to monitor him for at least a little bit. And she looks like, fair, I would do the exact same thing. Like, I will give you that. We'll give you that. That's exactly what I would do. But you know, he's safe. Yeah. And, you know, he's here. So like, right. So he's like, I'm not saying that there's not doubt in this situation, but my son is out of there. That, that, that's all I care about. I will monitor him. I will keep him safe. I will, the guard is for his safety as well as ours. Like, let's mm-hmm. do it. Yes. And then all of a sudden, Jack gets a weird look on her face. And I put, Mama knows best. Yeah. Through Disney. Uh, unfortunately, Mama didn't know best for the last, I don't know, three hours that they were like right. dealing with yeah. things. But it's fine. Um, apparently, this is the first time he smiled. Mm-hmm. So, uh, Tilk pulls her aside and is like, something's up. And she's like, okay, so like, I hate to be the one to say this. Don't want to run in the parade. I was totally with you that our son is safe. But like the day he got kidnapped, he was like training and he knocked out two of his teeth. And like they're definitely back. Mm-hmm. And I know he's a kid and like teeth are going to grow back, but like teeth don't grow back like that. Right. Um, so uh, it was like, questionable I, I trust you something's up something's up um so dr frazier is like here i'm gonna take a blood sample just to you know like test things out and he immediately starts freaking out um also during this whole time that they're in the scene he has only mentioned one thing over and over and over again and that it's that he wants to go outside and see the sun mm-hmm. which seems innocent until he got, just keeps saying it. And then you're like, there's something icky about that. Yeah. Um, so uh, they knock him out. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, then he wakes up in a prison cell in the base and immediately just starts screaming at his mother and telling her that he hates her for trying to stop him, which yeah. I'm not a mother yet. I'm a mother to a two-month-old lizard who um, tried to bite me today because I tried to take him out of his cage and he was happy. And um, (laughs) I literally threw a hissy fit that my um, lizard, who lizards don't even like being touched anyway, didn't want me to touch it. I could not imagine how I would react to my child telling me they hate me because I'm trying to stop them from killing their father. Right. Right. So... She's obviously not doing so hot. Mm-hmm. Um, turns out that the teeth in his mouth were each filled with a different virus that when combined would have become something so deadly it made anthrax look like like party glitter. Yeah. And um, it was going to be released into the atmosphere and within a week would have killed every single living thing on the entire planet. Right. Um, but like, good save. Right. Could have um, been bad. Thank you, Dreyak. Really. Right. 
Um, so they decide that they're going to have to become, begin deprogramming Rack. So uh, they try to do some psychological deprogramming and um, Teal'c basically tries to like win him over with love. And um, it turns out that like Apophis basically took the already existing anger of Teal'c leaving and twisted it into something like really awful and evil. And like, that is what's fueling his like thoughts that Teal'c is in fact a traitor. Mm -hmm. And that is basically every fictional villain origin story of all time. Right. Like mom and dad didn't love you. So then somebody else made you focus on that instead of love. Correct. Um, but so like Teal'c's trying really hard to bring, remind him what love is. And he just spits in Teal'c's face. And so Teal's like, I don't know, I don't know what else to do. Like, what is what are suggestions you have? And Jack suggests ECT and they talk about like what electroshock therapy would do. And Teal's like, is it the same like as a single shot from a zap gun? And they're like, Yeah, basically. And he goes, Okay. So instead of having Dr. Frazier do like actual electroshock therapy in a controlled way with anesthesia, Teal just shoots his son yeah it's okay one one time's fine one time is fine um it's not gonna kill him exactly. but it's like for sure gonna hurt yeah no it's not gonna feel good um um and then he's like in pain and like freaking out because he just got shot and he looks like here sing that song you used to sing to him when he was a baby that will make everything better and then it does. It does. Um, which again, a little too easy of a fix, in my opinion. Well, I don't know. You think about like when people die in Disney and there's a teardrop falls on them and it brings them back to life. Like, that's the same for me. You did not just compare this to an animated fairy tale. I did. I did indeed. That's still too easy of a fix. It doesn't make it less easy. No, it's fine. Um, so then they decide that they can't just have them live um, on base forever because that would be a horrible, miserable life for both of them. So they send them to live with Tuplo in the oh. land of light. First of all, yes, I love that. But yes. when he first wakes back up, he's like, where are we? He's like, are we home? And Dreyak's like, no, we're on SG base. Yeah. And he's like, is like my father here, whatever. He's like, yeah. And he's like, then to me, we are home. And I was like, oh. It was really beautiful. It was actually very beautiful. You're not wrong. It was. Um, but yeah. I'm thrilled they're going to the land of light. Yes. I every and Listen, we haven't even seen the land of light since the first episode, but we've seen Tuplo That's and talked so about Tuplo so many times that it's like, you know what? I don't even care. Let's just live in the land of light forever. Let's go That back. seems like a good place to be. Right. I'm all about it. So, um, what are, what are your thoughts? This episode felt like it fit <laughs> into the show we were watching. Correct. Um, I like uh brooke susan parker is Jack better she has more emotion I, behind her for sure yeah for sure um this kid that's rayak is an excellent actor great child actor really for, for a kid yeah super um i was impressed with his his being a kid um and i don't know shari doesn't exist anymore yep no nope. Shari is officially dead forever. And by that, oh. I mean, not really, but like, we might as well. She might as well. Be. Yeah. And like, Sam and Daniel Jackson didn't really talk this episode. They just kind of were there. Daniel talked once and it was useless. Right. And like, I think Sam may have talked once, but it was like a add on to something else. Yeah. But they were there, I guess. So, right. Even Jack was pretty minimal like yeah. other than other than the scene where he went after Frotok, he was right not really there yeah yeah so that was interesting um, 
Uh, there is one piece of trivia, well, two pieces of trivia. One is that Sally Richardson Whitfield did not repeat her role and uh, Brooke Susan Parker took over for Bray as Bray Talk. Um, but the other one um, is that for no clear reason ever discussed, SG-1 only uses Zat guns for the entire episode and not once do they use an earth weapon. The only feasible explanation is that they're quieter. Well, I bet it's because they know they're going up against Apophis once they go over there, and they know those guns are more effective. They're, but they're not. Like they're, I mean, they are in some ways, but like other than the one case of disintegration, they're not really used for the purpose of like that you would need a Zat gun. Like, so yes, but no. But like, there's. It's not that they're. It doesn't work. It works just fine. Mm -hmm. It's just that there's no explanation of it. Because up till this point, even when they have Zat guns with them, they still always refer revert to the the guns Which, first. That's true. I so, guess. So like this this is the first episode where like for no reason there's not a single regular gun in the episode. I don't know. Neither do the people on IMDb. Well, you know they also don't know how to write an episode, so I don't know. That's them with also them. fair. Um, who? You want to punch Apophis? He took Ryak. How dare he? No, he did. He did, but like bad guys got a bad guy. And I can punch him in the face. That's true. I'm for sure punching Frotok because what the fuck? Yeah. You marry your old best friend's wife when knowing full well he's not dead and then have the nerve to be pissed that she still likes him. Right. Right. That's on you, buddy. Mm -hmm. Despite the fact that I said I would have reacted the same way, like, still mad about it. <laughs> but also, it's been like six months. Right. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah, but like, he doesn't know that Tilk was there the last time. I bet he does. If he's on the same team as them, I'm sure she said something to him. Fair. Fair. I don't know. You're not wrong. Um, who was your MVP? I think Dreyak. Okay. She kind of kept the peace between everyone. Yeah. She's the one who That's saved a... all of human existence. That's very true. Um, very true. And that she would have choices for her child. Yeah. That would have been my first choice. Um, but my second choice is going to have to be Jack for killing Frotok and saving us whatever would have happened if a pop knew that Teal'c was there. Perfect. Good plan. Um, and like being the only one a voice of reason to be like, this is too easy. Yeah, no, yeah. Also for having <laughs> the sanity to be like, something is wrong. Right. Because if we had just like trusted Teal's judgment, death for everyone. Everyone, everyone yes. Quite literally everyone. Yeah. So, yeah. So, uh, Instead of asking what your thoughts in general about the next episode or like predictions are, because who fucking knows, my question is just going to be like a bold, a bold guess of how long you think it'll be before we discuss Ryak, Ryak and Dreyak again. Oh, God. <laughs> 20 years. Feels like 20 years. Five years. Oh, cool. So season, season seven, or yeah, season seven. Cool. Um, put that in my notes. Yeah. <laughs> Courtney's prediction, Ryan will return in season seven. Yes. <laughs> and I will be um, correct. Probably. I mean, at this point, Shari won't be back until season 10. She's gone. She's never coming back. <laughs> They've just hopefully forgot about that storyline. I mean, sometimes I do. Yes. Well, um, if you, my dear listeners, um, have thoughts about uh, when our former characters will emerge on the show, or if you have opinions on how long your partner needs to be in mourning before you, but after you die, before they move on. Because I think that that is a pretty, 
pretty juicy topic for discussion, truly. Um, please send us an email at deathandaliens at gmail.com or follow us on all of the social medias at Death and Aliens. It is now solidly into October, which means that Courtney is doing her 31 days of horror. Um, it also means that the time you have left to watch Hemlock Grove is dwindling. You have like maybe a week left when I <sighs> This comes out on the 9th, okay. so you have two weeks left. I thought it was the 17th. Not the 22nd. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Yeah, um, so tune in. Binge it. Make it your Halloween watch. Something. Something. I genuinely am pissed off that it's leaving. Like, I was a little bit disappointed, but now I'm, like, a little bit angry. Because, like, it's a Netflix original. So, like, if it leaves, it's It's not going anywhere. It literally, it like, it won't exist anymore. And that's they'll bring it back in like five years. It's like a reintroduction, you know? (sighs) You know. Just a really. I'm I'm sure I can find it somewhere super illegally online that I like won't discuss on the podcast. Um, Because we are super legal here. Yeah, we are. Um, But um, if you would like to contact me in particular, um, you can do that anywhere on the internet at E-M-K-A-Y underscore superstar. And if you want to talk to me or see what's going on in my life, you can follow me at C-E-Cloud 13. And we will see you back here on Thursday for a lovely episode of Thriller Thursday as we get so close to the end of season three of Bates Motel. So close. Bye. Yeah.